call it the United States, decides to opt out. Another country, let's call it China, decides to opt in because it perceives an economic or competitive or other benefit. What if that other society has some kind of big advantage, slightly better weapons and slightly better ships than everybody else? It led colonial era. What will happen? Let us now repeat the catechism. Community. Community. Identity. Identity. Stability. Stability. Welcome to GBS Deep Dive. I'm Nishma Minhas. We spend so much time talking about artificial intelligence, semiconductor wars, and Silicon Valley's power over our digital future. But there's another obsession quietly taking root in those same boardrooms and billionaire group chats, and it's not about machines at all. The 20th century arms race was nuclear. The 21st century arms race is going to be biological. It's about people, or more specifically, the next generation of people. It's something I thought was interesting. I hope you'll find it interesting as well. It does have a geopolitical angle to this as well. Something that I found very interesting and I thought you would also. So do give me your thoughts um, well, how you found the particular topic. It has major geopolitical implications as well that we really need to think about. From embryo editing startups in San Francisco to billionaires funding secret fertility labs, the Valley isn't just building smarter machines is trying to build smarter babies, or babies of a certain type. Parents are paying large amounts of money for new genetic testing services that include promises to screen these embryos for IQ, among other things. And to make it sound kosher, they've called it genetic optimization. The smartest, tallest, artistic kids with a future without hereditary disease. They're all Sydney Sweeney kids with great genes. Two startups in the San Francisco Bay, Bay Area, Nucleus Genomics and Heresite, have begun publicly offering IQ predictions based on genetic tests to help people select which embryos they want to use for IVF. Prices go between $6,000 and $50,000. But scratch the surface and you'll find something far older and far more dangerous. Because this isn't a brand new dream, it's an old ideology polished for the 21st century. Almost a century ago, Aldous Huxley warned about exactly this in his Brave New World. In his dystopian society, babies weren't born naturally, but were manufactured in hatcheries. They were engineered for intelligence, beauty or obedience, and they were divided into castes from alphas to epsilons. Pleasure and drugs like Soma kept people docile and individuality was erased in the name of social stability. Now what seemed like science fiction in 1932 now feels chillingly familiar. Today it's not state-run hatcheries, but Silicon Valley startups which are offering embryo gene screening. And China is not being left far behind. It has a massive genome projects which are pushing towards what they call high quality births. The danger is the same. When technology is used to optimize people, freedom and diversity become secondary to power and control. And some of the loudest voices in technology, from venture capitalists to Elon Musk, are now talking openly about who should have more children and who shouldn't. And if you think that's just talk, History says otherwise. When ultrasound technology spread across India and China in the 1980s and 1990s, it was hailed as a medical breakthrough. Doctors could check for birth defects, monitor development, and give parents a peace of mind. But in cultures where sons were prized over daughters, that technology became a weapon. Families started using it to find out the baby's sex, and if it was a girl, end the pregnancy. In rural India, dowry traditions made daughters an economic burden. In China, the one-child policy turned son preference into an iron rule. By the early 2000s, some Chinese provinces had ratios of 130 boys for every 100 girls, a demographic imbalance so extreme that it's distorted the entire society. Now in India, 500 year old laws and customs are being revised to allow men to marry out of caste, out of village and out of state. China is most severe in rural farmlands as women in these villages travel out to cities in search of husbands. And that has led to the emergence of quote, bachelor villages across the country. And the fallout, 
Both countries now face a shortage of women, which fuels human trafficking, forced marriages, and cross-border bride markets. In China, demographics also link it to the 421 problem, one child supporting two parents and four grandparents, and to the long-term decline of the working age population. This wasn't framed as eugenics at the time, but it's a reminder that when powerful technology meets deep social bias, the results can transform a nation for decades. Now let's fast forward to today. Silicon Valley isn't playing with ultrasound machines, it's now playing with human genomes. We're talking CRISPR edits on embryos. CRISPR is a revolutionary gene editing technology that allows scientists to precisely modify DNA. And we can get pre-implantation genetic testing to pick the best one. The gamete banks out there advertise for elite donors with Ivy League degrees and perfect SAT scores. The marketing, it's all about human potential, ending genetic disease, making that future brighter. But in the fine print, patents and investor decks that talk about cognitive performance, personality optimization, physical enhancement. This isn't fringe science anymore, it's a business model. And here's the geopolitical reality. This isn't just a Silicon Valley game. In Shenzhen, Beijing Genomics Institute, BGI as it's known, is mapping DNA at a scale that no Western company can match. Officially, it's about public health and disease prevention, but the capability overlaps perfectly with human enhancement. Think of it this way. In the US, an embryo IQ test is testing at around $50,000 per service, offered by some private startup to wealthy parents. In China, in China, genetic technology is tied to state policy, with mass prenatal screening programs framed as part of the national health. One system is market-driven, serving the elites. The other is state-driven, serving collective goals. And just like with AI and semiconductors, Whichever model proves to be more effective could tilt the balance of power towards that country. Silicon Valley's free market speed versus Beijing's centralized scale. That biotech race is now underway. And in a world where AI, chips, and space technology are already competitive backgrounds, gene technology is now shaping up to be the next strategic arms race. Elon Musk has tweeted for years about population collapse, especially in the developed countries. But listen closely. And the concern isn't about all people. It's about smart people having more kids, highly educated, high income, and let's be honest, often white. The fear that if birth rates in these groups fall, global power will shift, that the West will lose its dominance. So there's a demographic panic which is wrapped in this tech optimism. And it's the same thinking that fuels selective reproduction. What happens if the next Cold War isn't about AI or tanks, but about whose children are smarter, healthier, and longer lived? This isn't just Silicon Valley talk. Chinese academics have also warned about the risk of losing the population advantage to countries with younger, faster growing demographics. In both cases, the conversation isn't about morality. It's about maintaining the competitive edge in the global power structure. In fact, Demographics themselves are becoming a form of geopolitical currency. America cushions its low birth rates through immigration and wealth building schemes, such as lately introduced by Trump with his new baby accounts, which will give every US born child from 2025 to 2028 a $1,000 government deposit in a tax deferred investment account. It's all about promoting that long term population growth, preferably white population growth. The Trump accounts, as they call it, pilot program, which will make it possible for countless American children to have a strong start in life. Now, all our lives, many of us have grown up hearing about China's one-child draconian policy. But now China's population is shrinking for the first time in six decades. It's a turning point that's rattling policymakers in Beijing as well. To counter the decline, the government scrapped that policy several years ago. It's introduced tax breaks, housing subsidies, and extended parental leave to encourage people to have larger families. Some promises are even offering cash rewards just for a second or third child. But officials aren't just focused on the birth rate. There's a growing discussion about 
Yao Zhi Sheng Yu, or high quality births, a term that blends public health with the idea of improving population quality. It's a shift that opens that door to debates about how far technology should go in shaping the next generation. Both nations have the same problem. Fewer babies mean weaker economies, ultimately. Demographics is not just a social policy. It's a pillar of geopolitical strength. When the US leans on its immigration or those wealth building schemes, China, on the other hand, leans on how to increase its domestic population engineering. If chips are that brains of the AI, then DNA is the brain of nations. And the US and China both know it. We've been here before. In the early 20th century, eugenics wasn't a Nazi idea. It was actually an American export. Wealthy American philanthropists funded research. States passed sterilization laws. Judges signed off on surgeries to improve the population. In the United States, 32 states once had compulsory sterilization laws. The poor, the disabled, minorities, they were all targeted. California's programs were so influential that Nazi Germany studied them when it was crafting its own racial policies. They came up with Nazi Germany's elimination of undesirable people. And the logic was simple and deadly. Some lives are worth more than others. After World War II, the world eugenics became toxic. But the ideas, they didn't disappear. They were rebranded as genetic counseling, population quality, even public health now we see. The only real change is who holds the power. Back then it was the state and now it's increasingly the market. And in a world where US and China and others are all racing for biotech dominance, that decision might be made by whoever wins the race, not by the rest of us. And here's a geopolitical twist. If the US, China or the EU set the ethical boundaries for genetic technology, they won't just be writing their own rules, they'll be deciding the global norms. For smaller nations, that could mean accepting someone else's definition of what it means to be human capital. And which raises that biggest geopolitical question of all. If the United States pushes ahead with private biotech and China with those state-led programs, whose rules will become the world's? Just as Washington and Beijing battle to set those standards in AI chips and 5G, they're now circling each other in the most intimate battlefield of all, the human genome. And whoever defines the ethics and patents here won't just profit, they'll shape the very future of humanity. Could genetic technology be used for good? Sure, yes. Imagine ending Huntington's disease, a brain disorder, or erasing cystic fibrosis, a genetic disorder that primarily affects the lungs and the digestive system, or simply extending healthy lifespan. But here's the problem. Once you have the power to eliminate disease, it's a short jump to eliminating anything considered undesirable. And history tells us that society's definition of undesirable is rarely objective. Beauty or undesirability is in the eye of the beholder. Now DARPA, which stands for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is the research and development arm of the US Department of Defense. It's known for its high risk, high reward research focused on developing cutting edge technologies for national security. The organization is already doing intensive work looking at genetic resilience, potentially creating soldiers in the future that are resistant to disease, stress or fatigue. Similarly, military researchers in China are openly publishing on gene editing for battlefield endurance and faster recovery. What happens if only the wealthy can afford genetic upgrades? What happens when human worth is measured by a lab report before birth? The tools are already here. The bias is already here. The only thing missing is the moment they collide. Silicon Valley says it's chasing human progress. But history warns us when you mix power, profit and control, over reproduction, you don't just get better babies. You get a blueprint for deciding who gets to exist. The last century's balance of power was built on the steel, the oil and the nukes. And the next one may be built on DNA. And the question is, whose blueprint is going to win? Share with me your thoughts on genetic engineering. 
Thank you for watching me today and have a great day.